Welcome to the five people that are here in the sanctuary, but also to the many people that are, are watching from home or online. Um, St. Andrews <clears throat> has always tried to center itself on universal love, which means uh, we know that many of the people that are tuning in are not Presbyterian, not Christian, maybe not religious, but what unites us is that belief in a love that does justice and includes us all. So we hope that this brief half hour service will feel like a contact point with the parts of life that we can really forget in a fearful time, a, a time of this coronavirus. Um, we hope that at, at the end of this service that you will remember who you are as a human being, that you will remember the ties that bind you to others and to realize that uh, nature is a home that uh, will endure through all of this. So whoever you are, <coughs> wherever you're watching from, uh, we wish you peace and, and welcome you to this service. In the first glimmers of morning, the world begins to take shape. First vague outlines, patterns of light and dark, then colors, dun branches of trees and withered winter grass. The brightening sky bathes a familiar landscape with a glow as it sleepily reveals itself. Blessed morning. Oh, to have another day, to wake from whatever night thoughts dwell within. To rise 
and have the world unfold before us. Where the possible unwinds into the actual. Where dreams await their fulfilling. Where we meet once again to live into the hope that gathers us. Blessed, Blessed morning. morning. Amen. Amen. Walking alone in the gray space on the rough and ragged cobblestones of ambiguity where the path within uncertainty's bewildering maze is wandering and wandering, moving back, circling back again and again and again, spinning, shaking, stumbling, the human panic-stricken cries out, desperately wanting out, scrambling, seeking escape, relief, desperately longing for the familiar place of absolutes, where questions are limited to those already safely answered, desperately ready to settle for shallow serenity. When there's a nest of plastic safety within a pale facsimile of peace, but their love is, smiling with arms open wide to embrace the human heart, Sophia's spirit Heart of wisdom, heart of creativity, birthing, breathing, whispering. Fear not the gray space, child, for it's the place where the brightest colors are born in new questions that feed and lead the soul into new and deeper life and real peace. Come now into sacred space to know gray space as not an alone place at all, for their love is with you and me and us all. And their love is making all things new. Be centered now in the intimate welcome and warmth of love's guiding light. unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. A reading from Psalm 90. Holy One, you have been our refuge from one generation to the next. Before the mountains were born, you brought forth the earth and the world. You are God without beginning or end. You turn humankind back into dust and say, go back creatures of the earth. For in your sight a thousand years are like yesterday, come and gone, no more than a watch in the night. You sweep us away like a dream, fleeting as the grass that springs up in the morning. 
In the morning it sprouts, but by evening it has withered and died. In the same way we are consumed, terrified by your anger and indignation. Our guilt lies open before you. Our secrets are revealed in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your anger, and our life is over like a sigh. The span of our life is but 70 years, perhaps 80 if we're strong, but the best of them are nothing but sorrow and pain. They pass swiftly, and they are gone. Who understands the power of your anger? We fear the strength of your wrath. Make us realize how short life is, that we may gain wisdom of the heart. Holy One, relent. How long before you have mercy on your faithful ones? When morning comes, fill us with your love and we will celebrate all our days. Give us joy for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we knew misfortune. Let your work be seen by your faithful, your glory be witnessed by their children. Let the giver of life's favor be upon us. Grant success to the work of our hands, success to the work of our hands. Ancient words from our tradition, for our present day understanding. Thanks be to God. <coughs> it may seem like a strange thing to lift up a psalm like that in the middle of the coronavirus epidemic, to take an old reading from an old scripture an old book um, clearly has some problems in it in, in how it looks at life. Obviously, whoever wrote this was very depressed. <coughs> I think the way to look at Scripture, I don't, I don't take up Scripture for science. I don't take up Scripture to learn really even ethics. I think what scripture gives us is a certain perspective of our lives that is larger, deeper than maybe ordinary living can take us. It would be as if someone found a diary from your parents and they were talking about you as a child before you can remember. And they're talking about things, important things that happened in your life that you didn't even know about. That would be a kind of scripture for you, that would open up information that within your little personal span of life would not be available. There would be windows for, for a larger life. And if somebody found a diary of your parents, your grandparents, looking at your parents, that would give you a larger sense of the story that you were born into. So when we take up scripture, we're not going into autopilot, we're not shutting our mind down, we're not shutting our ethics down. What we're doing is becoming a part of a larger story that opens our heart to the fact that almost everything we can go through, somebody has gone through it before us and has felt what we feel. And sometimes hearing somebody else make this plaintive cry is what helps us understand our own grief and our own fear. Listen to these words. <clears throat> we are consumed by thy anger and by thy wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities, iniquities before us, our secret sins are in the light of thy countenance. That isn't necessarily helpful theologically or philosophically, but that's how life feels sometimes. When things, when life is unfair, one of the first places our mind goes is, what did I do wrong to deserve this? Or if you're like me, what did somebody else do wrong that I can blame it on? But our own little personal reference points are not enough to understand life itself, being itself. We need larger windows to consider what is happening. What the psalmist does is start with our emotional imbalance and then lead us to insights 
and eventually return us to a home for our heart. You can't lift yourself out of tragic times, but there's a depth within us where we can carry our joy and our peace and our sense of interconnectedness, even through times like this. When we run across this concept of the wrath of God, that's a very uh, kind of poetic way of understanding how life feels when we are out of balance with it. We have a nature biologically. And the world we live in has a nature. And when we are out of tune with that, it can feel like we're haunted and hunted by hostile forces. It can feel like we are in hell. That somebody's hunting us, no matter what we do. There isn't really an angry God, I don't think, but I do think life can feel like that. This is um, one of the great theologians of our day. And again, we're never assuming that you believe um, this literally. We don't assume you believe anything. This is, this is trying to go deeper in the universal human experience. And N.T. Wright is looking at this idea of the wrath of God. And he says, again, if you're not a theist, then see this as poetry. God's wrath properly is an aspect of God's love. It is because God loves human beings with a steady, unquenchable passion that God hated apartheid, that God hates torture and cluster bombs, and that God loathes slavery, and that God's wrath is relentless against the rich who oppress the poor. If God was not wrathful against these and so many other distortions of our human vocation, then God would not be loving. And it is God's love determining to deal with that nasty, insidious, vicious, soul-destroying evil that causes God to send God's special child. Now, that's the, that's the theology of Christian poetry. But in a sense, it's talk about every one of us as being sent as a special child into the world. And to understand that when we are out of tune with nature, when we are out of turn, at tune with our hu universal human fam family, we feel allergic to life itself. We feel a sickness in our bones that isn't coming from some angry deity. It's coming from the lack of connectedness with things. Calvin said that when a nation is evil and God wants to punish it, God sends evil rulers. Um, I think we can check that one off. Um, but it, that wouldn't be happening if we didn't share many of the same vicious habits. If we were offended by poverty, deeply offended by poverty, and wouldn't cooperate with systems of oppression. If we were deeply offended by racism, by sexism, by our nation's imperial uh, sense that it has a right to go into other nations and bomb them into conformity. If we are not offended by those things, then the web that ties us together itself begins to unravel. When I was a kid, I often thought my parents were angry with me because they wanted me to do things like brush my teeth. What theologians are saying is hell is what it feels like when you are out of tune with life, with love, with the tie that binds us all together. My parents made me brush my teeth. They made me make my bed. And when I got old enough, I looked in the Geneva Conventions to see if this was some kind of a war crime. Um, but it was love that didn't feel good. It didn't feel good because I was a child. We have to grow up in the kind of love that does justice, that takes care of ourselves, that chooses health uh, and not just pleasure. So, <coughs> it is a mistake to think that there is some invisible person somewhere that's hunting us down. But that's a good poetic way to get in touch with that sense of being imbalanced. I was, I've also been in musical bands. And when somebody doesn't care enough to tune their own instrument, I don't care how hard you try, I guess this is aimed at, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. 
<laughs> you can't, I can't tune an electric piano. I'm just I can't. But uh, we've all been in musical groups where there was somebody who was syncopated in their own rhythm. That unless we find a common chord to tune ourselves to, there is dissonance and discord against our best efforts. Scripture is trying to help us think of that in terms of all of life and not just one particular area. This time of disease, this time of fear, uh, this time of separation is a kind of forced Sabbath. It's a forced stepping out of the routine where we can really think about did our hearts ever really fit in this system anyway? Is a system that's based on greed and aggression and violence and everybody's okay with it as long as we ship it off seas? We can have wage slaves but they have to be in Micronesia. And as long as we don't hear about it, then we're fine. That hurts us from inside. That eats at us from, from the inside. And that pain is actually our ties to love. This is what Wright is trying to say. That what feels like hell sometimes is actually love. That which would return us to interconnectedness and, and inner being. If a couple got married and one of them loved wrestling and the other loved opera, one of them would be at hell, in hell at all times. Right? Whatever they decided to do for the evening, one of them would be miserable and the other would be euphoric. That's what the poetic image is talking about, that lack of balance, that lack of attunement. Our bodies have instincts written into them. So when we walk along and we see something squiggly on the ground, our instincts tell us to be afraid of it, to avoid it. Uh, if you see um, an animal that's bigger than you with pointy things, fingers and teeth and stuff, our, our, our body tells us to run away. If we're going along and we see meat that's blue, there's a part of us that says, don't eat that. So those are instincts, and we wouldn't be here as a species if we didn't have them, but they're generic. They don't always work, and sometimes they're the worst uh, th thing of all. They're the, 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 the least wise part of ourselves. Scripture's like that, too. It's talking about a generic experience and a generic wisdom that sometimes isn't what we want to do. But by living and breathing in that story, we remember that it's bigger than just ourselves. We remember that we're tied to people that we may not even like. We may not know. We're tied to other species. We're tied to nature and to the weather. And if we make ourselves comfortable while we're out of tune with those things, destruction follows us like our own shadow. So the stories of Scripture are not perfect. They are not good science. They're not always good ethics. But they're a great perspective enhancer to help us understand what it means to be a human being in the cosmos. We have to let go of the parts of our experience that are fleeting, and we have to identify the core of our life with what unites us, what, what ties us together, not what, with, not what separates us. What that allows us to do is to have a home for our heart. We go through the same experiences, <coughs> the same dangerous situation uh, of disease, of sickness, of war, all of those things. What is different is our tune our hearts are tuned to a kind of cosmic song. And we're not defined by that which separates us. We're not defined by the pain, but we're defined by our interconnectedness and our hopes for one another. So when the author of the psalm says, how long, O oh God? You also get the, the, the sense of an answer as long as we disown uh, the tie that binds. As long as we choose property over humanity, we will feel wrath. We will feel that pain. As long as we choose selfishness over interconnectedness, as long as we choose the past over the present and the future, 
as long as we turn to choose property over human beings and animals and plants and minerals, we are being eaten from the inside out. So the irony that Psalm 90 is trying to bring us to is that times of sickness can also be times of healing. That which makes us physically and emotionally uncomfortable can be what puts us in touch with those deep abiding parts of ourselves that live in the long story, that live in the whole of things, that can have peace and joy even in these horrific times. I'm getting sent wonderful poems during this time. And I'm sure you've had the same experience where people are saying, well, I hate this. I hate that people are sick. But you know, I'm slowing down and I'm kind of remembering my humanity here. Without minimizing the fear and danger of what's happening. That's important too. Listen to this poem that someone, um, Gay Copas sent me. It's by Kitty O'Meara. Who writes, and the people stayed home. She's talking about this time of social distancing. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still. And listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently. And the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless, and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and to heal the earth fully as they had been healed. The psalmist asks us the question, how long? Will this pain, this fear last? Also, the psalmist gives us the answer by saying, remember, O people. Remember that you belong to time. Remember that you belong to nature. And most importantly, remember that you belong to each other. This is what gives us a home for the heart. I invite you now to your own reflection on these words. Thanksgiving, sing.
sing hallelujah. Gifts and blessings, love we tell. Spirit breathing, all is well. Spirit breathing, all is well. Awe and Wonder is the song that we normally play at St. Andrew's after we have taken the offering. And of course, we are not all together this morning, and so we can't have the time of passing the plate around the sanctuary. And what we try and think of as we're here planning worship at St. Andrew's, we try and think of that time of taking the offering, of having the baskets move through the sanctuary, is that it's a twofold invitation. This, Baskets are being passed and folks are putting money in and of course it is a time to remember the ways that we can financially support the church and support the church in other ways. And then it's also a time for us to think about generosity in a broader sense, about what are the gifts we have in our own life and how can we share that, not necessarily with the church, but with our beloved community in a broader sense. So we have those same two invitations today as we're gathering a different way. So we aren't able to pass a basket and receive physical gifts today, but we do still need support from our community. St. Andrews has made the commitment that we are gonna continue paying all of our staff, not just me and Jim, but the whole staff, including our childcare workers and our musicians throughout this time, uh, because we don't wanna put them in a difficult economic position just because of the pandemic, so we continue to have bills and we would continue to love the support of our community, you can go to our website, staopen.org, to find ways to give online, or you can mail checks in, and we continue to appreciate that. But even bigger than the ways that we support the church during this time, this is a time that we are invited to support one another. And there are so many stories coming out right now about incredible generosity and community and solidarity that we are seeing as a result of this pandemic. So for each of us, that looks a different way, but as we have this time of worship, we invite you to reflect on how does it look for you to be radically human in this time of isolation and distance? What does it look like to you to support your community? Maybe that's thinking of a nonprofit who might be having a hard time right now because of the pandemic and making a financial donation to that. Maybe it's making a special point of staying home so that you're not contributing to the pandemic. Maybe it's finding an organization that needs some volunteers that can work over the phone. There's a lot of different ways that we can support each other right now. Maybe it's checking on a neighbor. There's so many ways that we can support each other right now, support our community, and be really and authentically human. And this is a time for us to think about that. We invite you to reflection, and we invite you to action as you feel appropriate. Amen. Good morning, St. Andrews, and our community beyond these walls. We're gathered here this morning with social distancing in mind. We each get to have our own section of the church. But as I stand here, I can see your lovely faces and feel how you grace this community with your presence on Sunday morning. It's a new world out there. I've had time to walk extensively this week and to bake some bread. I walk in the park that's near my home. Spring has sprung. The blue bonnets are blooming. There are fresh buds on the trees. The creek is gurgling. 
and families are out with children and pets. The kids are on bikes and scooters and in strollers, and some of the pets are in strollers and little wagons. I don't really get that, but, but they're all out there, the young and the old, keeping safe distance, but feeling less stressed for just being with Mother Nature. This week I listened to Carrie Newcomer, who has a song entitled Sanctuary. It is quite lovely and a tune that, given the chance, will stick in your head and bring meaning and strength as you play it over and over, especially in my case when I was walking. The words, will you be my refuge, my haven in the storm? Will you keep the embers warm when my fire's all but gone? Will you remember and bring me sprigs of rosemary? Be my sanctuary till I can carry on, carry on, carry on. The you might be the sacred, the divine, God the creator, or Mother Nature. Will you help me, help us, to carry on in this confusing, anxious time that we are now living? Be my haven in this storm, these days more than ever. We pray prayers for safety, for answers, for love, and caring for those who are struggling, hungry, without shelter, jobless, fearful, anxious, lonely. Those who struggle with health every day and are now confronted with greater risk to health and safety from this virus. We remember those who are nearing life's end, who are now separated from loved ones, those needing help to care for family and no way to get it. We remember all of the children and refugees now facing even greater danger from this impending virus. We pray for hope, for healing, for strength to carry on as we wait for more answers, more assistance, and as we cope with life that has been changed for all of us. Loving one, will you be our refuge, our shelter, our haven from the storm. Will you keep the embers warm when our fires all but gone? Will you remember and bring sprigs of rosemary? Be our sanctuary, our hope, our strength, until we can carry on with love, with kindness, with hope for all, for us and them. Help us rest in you, hope in you, until we can carry on, carry on, and on. Amen. We're done, right? I think so. Do you have a benediction? I have a benediction. And then we are the ones. Okay. I just want to make sure I hadn't forgotten something. So. Well, the word benediction <clears throat> means healing words, benevolent words. So whatever it is that you believe about our world, about our particular situation, as you go out into this strange um, world we inhabit right now, 
whether you think of the creative energies that have given you life as God or as an evolutionary process or as a cosmic process, whatever your heart recognizes as home, may you feel that creativity, that love, that benevolence going with you now, and may you feel it remain with you always. Go in peace. courage to answer the call. These are the times we've been waiting for. We can't hold back anymore. God who is faithful will give us all the courage to answer the call. The courage to answer the call.